Welcome to the Funny Cause It's True podcast. I'm your host, Kevin McGeehan. Funny Cause It's True is recorded live every other Tuesday at the Second City Hollywood in Los Angeles, California. Storytellers are either predetermined or chosen randomly on the night of the show to tell a true story based on different themes. And this podcast is a mixed bag of some of my favorites. The theme of this episode is unwanted guests. Those things that, like fish, smell bad after three days. Allie Davis describes why she will never throw another holiday party after a hypnagogic hallucination puts a damper on the festivities. And I recount how I recently forced my roommate to reminisce about a two-week time period in the summer of 2010, a fortnight that I can safely say he would much rather forget. But let's not dawdle. First up, Allie Davis. Um... It's the story of why I only ever had one holiday party here in L.A. Um, uh, I had a holiday party. uh, I had a solstice party after I had lived here for almost exactly one year. And uh, my family is Christian, but I'm not to an extent that it felt weird to have a Christmas party. So I had it on the 21st, and I felt like we could all agree that astronomically, (laughs) yes, the light was coming back, and it was a perfectly good excuse to have a party. Um, I didn't invite the neighbor across from me because he's creepy and watches me all the time. And I didn't invite the neighbors over here because all they did was either scream at each other or have loud sex. Uh, But the neighbor over here was this very nice uh, young Korean guy somewhere in his mid to late 20s. Really sweet, but from Korea. And we really only had about five words in common. And uh, I thought about inviting him, but we had hello, goodbye, and a couple of... uh, (laughs) And uh, I was having an oil and water party. I was worried. I was inviting my improv dork friends and my college friends who had moved out here. And I was already worried about them mixing. Long story short, I didn't invite him. Uh, And the party was lovely. And it went late, but not too late. And I had a great time. And I went to bed with a warm feeling of, God, I really have nice friends. I am lucky to have nice friends. Went home for Christmas, came back. And there's an eviction notice on this neighbor's door, which was sad. And I thought maybe he had gone home to Korea, or maybe he just skipped out and found a better place. Uh, And in fact, the truth of it came out a couple days later when workmen on the roof of the building across the way saw him hanging from the ceiling fan. And he'd been there for a while. Uh, And my wonderful friends tell me about the party I had that caused him to kill himself from loneliness. And (laughs) I would, there's a part of me that would go with for that, except for this, uh, which is that in the weeks leading up to uh, the party, the December, I started having spontaneous crying jags all the time, and I couldn't figure out why. I've been depressed. It wasn't like depression, and when I've been depressed before, it was for a damn good reason. It was a breakup or a job loss, and I was actually doing pretty well. I had a screenplay in development, uh, what I would later find out why they called it development hell, but I didn't know that then, Uh, and I had good friends, and I was forging relationships with my sisters who are out there and things are going really well and I would just have these random crying jags where I'd be thinking I don't know why I'm sad I can't figure out what's going on and that happened for a few weeks leading up to Christmas and disappeared when I went home for a stressful Christmas with the family and started again when I came back and then one night um, I had what I know is called a hypnagogic hallucination which is a hallucination when you're coming out of sweet sleep, but you're not quite. Or, if you're from other cultures, I had a visit from the night hag. Um, and the night hag is a cross-cultural phenomenon. You'll hear stories of a similar thing in Central Asia, Southeast Asia, China, Africa, everywhere has the night hag. If you talk about being haggard or hag-written, that's what that's from. We have that in our culture, too. Uh, so it's either a biological phenomenon that most humans experience at some point, or... or <laughs> or it's not. (laughs) So what happened was I suddenly woke up at night and all of the lights in my apartment were on and the cats were sitting there as though it was perfectly normal. What was not normal was that there was something evil in the room. And if you asked me up until that day, I would say, no, you can't sense evil, that's ridiculous. You can, I now know what it feels like. And um, I couldn't time out this story because I was too afraid to speak any part of it in my apartment out loud. Um, So it was a ball of evil uh, in the corner of my apartment, like it was made out of black smoke, and I knew it was there, and it knew I was there, and it did not care for me. And it wanted to hurt me very, very badly. 
And the front of my brain has read about this. The front of my brain is saying, this is a hypnagogic hallucination. You've read about these. You know what it is. You're in sleep paralysis. You know what's going on. The animal part of my brain, the lower part is just going, ah! because that's all it can do. I can't scream because I'm in sleep paralysis. Fucking cats, no help at all. They're just sitting there. <laughs> So I'm going through it in my mind going, you don't have to be scared. Ah! You don't have to be scared because you know what's happening. You know what this is. And pretty soon it's going to feel like it's coming out of the corner of the room. And it did. And it's coming down towards you. And it did. And it still hated me a whole lot. And it settled on my chest. And what happens when the night hag settles on your chest is you can't breathe anymore. And I could feel it pressing down. And there was nothing I could think of to do to stop it. It was there. And the front of my brain is still telling me what's going on, but the middle of my brain knows it's real. It doesn't fucking matter because I can't breathe. So I started trying to think of what you did to dispel these things, and I started reciting the Lord's Prayer. Um, and then the front, of my brain, the front part of my brain is really annoyed because I'm from a church of the Brethren, which is a tiny little offshoot church, Anabaptists. They say a different version of the Lord's Prayer than most people do. And I couldn't remember, is it debt and debtors or trespassers and trespassing that we have to figure? And it doesn't matter! And so I'm going... <laughs> because it's still on my chest. And I'm going, Our Father who art in be thy name. And I can't remember parts of it. I have to keep starting over. And then I think, my God, this is beneath both of us. And I meant me and the thing. We both know that this is just something I'm reciting. And I didn't even have a fucking Christmas party. I had a solstice party. We both know this isn't something I can do. So now I have nothing. And I'm going through my head. And thank God I'm an enormous dork who's read a lot of folklore. So there's a South American spirit called the duende that's the, similar to the night hag that strangles women. And the duende crushes the breath out of you, but it is very offended by profanity. And now we are in my wheelhouse, friends. <laughs> so I swore at it. Motherfucker, get off me, pig fucker. Pig fucker, I know came into it. I don't know the rest. <laughs> and I swore at it until it went away and I could go to sleep. And if you ask me what happened in the daytime, I will tell you that two unrelated incidents happened. My neighbor killed himself because he was very lonely, probably gay, and that's not cool in Korea. And I had a natural brain response, a hypnagogic hallucination, perhaps due to alcohol consumption or something. If you ask me at night, there was something in our apartments that was making us both horribly sad for no reason and was feeding on us. And a part of me thinks it just got him first. Next up, me. Kevin McGeehan. The other day, I was reminiscing with my roommate. To be more specific, I was forcing him to reminisce the other day about a specific event, specifically the summer of 2010, when he made me so angry. But I made a promise to him that one day I was going to laugh about it with him. And the other day, I decided this is it. Today's the day we're going to laugh about this. Mike is what I'll call him for this story. Mike, my roommate, and I <laughs> have known each other a very, very long time. We met, we met back in 1996, and we've been friends ever since, but we've lived together about two years now. Within the first six months I lived there, uh, he started dating this woman, and uh, an age-appropriate woman that lived across the country, and they had a long-distance relationship, and it was very sweet, and they got along very well, and he was very excited about it. He was giddy all the time, and it was so nice to see him like this. Uh, uh, she came out to visit, and I met her, and she seemed very pleasant. She was um, just a stunning, stunning woman, uh, this uh, very hot blonde who, um, who had the beautiful face of Angelina Jolie, the rock and bod of Pamela Anderson, and as evidenced by a number of very emotional Facebook status updates, had the fickle disposition of a house cat. <laughs> For the purposes of this story, I will call her Kitty. So Mike and Kitty were getting along famously. Uh, she came to visit. Like I said, I met her. She was very, very nice. And um, then she left, and then he was sad. And they stayed in touch on the phone, and they really, really wanted to make this work. So he came to me one day and said, Kev, would you be cool if Kitty came and stayed with us indefinitely? We want to give it a shot. And I said, fine. I'm not going to stand in your way. You seem so very happy. I'm not going to stand in your way. Sure, that's fine. 
Then it started to unravel because I found out she was a package deal. Because it wasn't just her. It would be her, her cat, and her, wait for it, 16-year-old daughter. So they were going to live with us indefinitely. Uh, A few days before they were supposed to arrive, Mike did something that made her so angry that she was just furious. And the reason I know she was furious, and I can say this with assuredness, is that she shared it on Facebook for everyone. Very specific things of what was going on in their relationship, what was wrong with it, all the things that he had done, and wanted him to make a grand apology on Facebook. As a good friend, I helped him through this bad time. He was very upset, very sad about what was happening, and I made sure that I was there for him. I was a friend, and I heard all about the things that was going on between them. I saw all the text messages. I saw all the emails. I learned a really good assessment of this woman, which was less than favorable. (laughs) But I was right there for him, and I said to him, do you even want her to come visit? And he said, no, I don't. I said, so she's probably not coming. He said, no, she won't even answer me. She's probably not coming. Two days later, he came to me with a big smile on his face and said, yes, she's coming. They're going to be here tomorrow. They were here 14 days. Mike and Kitty broke up on day five. (laughs) Now, the thing that I find interesting is that We have certain bits of behavior that are just ingrained in us and that we never lose. And one of them was when I was a teenager and I would go visit my father and his uh, new family, uh, I would be very, uh, I was shy and I didn't really want to fit in with them. So I would disappear for hours just going on long bike rides or when I was able to drive, I'd go off on long car rides and just would not be around. So I found myself right when they arrived immediately imitating this behavior and I just disappeared for day one. Day two, I had dinner with them. Kitty was very excited to be there, and uh, they were all making dinner, and uh, the 16-year-old daughter, Mike, Kitty, and we all went on the front porch and had a nice dinner. Uh, But what Kitty had made was a very spicy meal, and she wanted Mike to try it. Mike said to her, I can't. My system won't take spicy. I can't eat spicy. I'm really sorry. I'll eat it without the spice. And she got mad really, really mad and made it abundantly clear how angry she was at him. And then when I ate the spicy food, made it abundantly clear that she was going to emasculate him by claiming that I was much more of a man than him for eating this food. When in actuality, I was a big old puss because I didn't want to say, I don't want to eat your spicy food. And I had to deal with it for 12 hours following. Day four, I arrive home, and Mario Kart is being played. I sit down and start playing Mario Kart Kart against Mike, and Kitty and the 16-year-old daughter begin to cheer. It's a really exciting game, and when you really get into it, it's really fun. And then it started becoming a little mean of, hey, baby, get him. Get him. You beat him. Beat him now. Get him. Crush him. Just vehemently at the top of her lungs. And then the 16-year-old daughter piped in, go, Kevin. (laughs) At which point, Kitty turned to her and said, no, you do not root for him. You root for Mike. (laughs) To which the 16-year-old daughter responded in a very sad way, but Kevin's got no one to root for him. (laughs) To which was responded, doesn't matter. You root for Mike. On day six, (laughs) on day six, Mike came to me and said, you know what, I I can't take this anymore. Um, She's very critical of me. Uh, We're just not getting along, and we broke up. Um, They're going to leave tomorrow. Glee enveloped my body. I was so very excited that they were actually going to go, and this, uh, this horrible experience was going to be done. So... That morning, on the morning that they're supposed to leave, it is so 
uncomfortable in the house. It is British office uncomfortable in the house. <laughs> to where Mike is sitting in the dining room and the 16-year-old daughter comes out to say, did you get our ticket yet? Obviously a task that had been given to her by Kitty because she didn't want to face the now exes. It was awkward and I just went up to Kitty and with my most sincere words said, I'm really glad to have met you. <laughs> and then I walked out of the house so excited that this was finally over. But then something happened during the day that changed all of that. <laughs> and if you are curious as to what that was, I will tell you in part two of the story. That's it. That's our show. Tune in next week for part two of the Mike and Kitty saga, where I receive an unexpected email on day seven, one that completely changes the dynamic of the house. But until then, special thanks to our storyteller this week, Ali Davis. Also thanks to Josh Callahan, Mark Warzeka, The Second City Hollywood, and the Comedy Podcast Network for producing the show. If you would ever like to see the live show, Funny Cause It's True is every other Tuesday at 10 p.m. at the Second City Hollywood, located on beautiful and mildly scary Hollywood Boulevard. You can also like Funny Cause It's True on Facebook to find out upcoming show dates and themes. If you enjoyed this episode of the podcast, feel free to take a moment to give us a good rating or write a nice comment on iTunes. It would be greatly appreciated and, quite honestly, would help us out a ton. The next live show is Tuesday, March 27th, and the theme will be A Friend in Need. Mark Warzeka is being a friend indeed that night because he is taking over the hosting duties since I will be across town at the Echoplex competing in the Moth Grand Slam competition. So come out to the show, put your name in contention, and maybe you'll get chosen to tell a true story on stage, and from there, get chosen to be on the podcast. My name is Kevin McGeehan. Thanks for listening. For more funny stuff for your eyes and ears, go to ComedyPodcastNetwork.com.